Colin Greer comes to us from Vancouver, Washington. Uh, WSU extension, right? Yeah, so an associate professor in anthropology. He's been doing all kinds of cool work that we're going to hear about, digging up old remains and whatnot up there in the Sailor Sea. Uh, and we'll learn more about that. Colin Greer, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Stefan, and thanks, everyone, too, uh, for coming, of course. Um, I'm happy to be speaking in an environmental college. I'm an anthropologist. I'm an archaeologist, which is a kind of anthropologist, of course, concerned with the archaeological record of human diversity and variation around the world. So that's, that's my thing. I'm actually originally from the other Vancouver, just up across the border. So I'm kind of double Vancouver. Um, and that's where I've done most of my archaeological research over the last 20 years, 25 years. And uh, I'm going to be talking about that a fair bit today. Not the nitty gritty down in the, the trenches kind of archaeology, but the big picture kind of stuff. So it's nice to be in an environmental college where I can connect some of the social science approaches and ideas that I bring to my field research with the ecology side of things and the environmental side of things. Because a lot of my work in the last while has been more and more interdisciplinary, thinking outside the box of the discipline of archaeology or anthropology, connecting ecology, environments, human societies, coupling those things, finding those crossover points, those intersections to get at the big picture, right? The big picture of how we're going to use all of this knowledge that in these universities that we're generating to solve real problems looking forward. So I'm going to take us from a lot of thinking about the past, and I'll talk about that from an archaeological perspective, but the whole objective here being in a, outside of my usual anthropology, archaeology universe, is to draw from that to try and think about how we're going to map a way forward, and I'll get around to talking about that um, in the end. So kind of a blend of hard and soft science, so to speak, although as a social scientist, you add people to anything and then it really becomes hard to figure it out. So the people sciences is kind of the hard sciences from a difficulty point of view. So we'll see how all that goes. Um, so this is what we're in for today. I'm going to start with a couple more comments on this big picture, this idea of pushing interdisciplinarity and thinking beyond our own boxes and buildings and labs and pulling things together at a large scale. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about, like I said, is not going to be nitty gritty archaeology, but the big picture questions at stake. So hopefully that'll be something useful for uh, people who are maybe aren't uh, interested in the nitty gritty of the archaeology necessarily. Then I want to talk about constructed coastscapes in the Salish Sea. And this is what I put in my abstract as the main empirical part of the talk. And I'm going to talk about the archaeological record of the Gulf Islands, which are, of course, just north of the border. We've got the San Juans right out here. Yeah, the Gulf Islands are there, too. So I work mostly on the Canadian side of the border in the Gulf Islands. And talk about 20 years of studying the construction of coastlines, of the whole system of production, resource production that Salish Sea people were up to over really the last five millennia. So constructed coastscapes, what are they? Why do they matter? Get back to the big picture of this. It's not just about the archaeology, as interesting as that may be. But why do they matter for thinking about how people have lived sustainably and in a resilient way in the Salish Sea for millennia, for the entire Holocene, really? So the, I'm going to run you through a bit of that archaeological record. And then I want to shift into thinking about well, if I can invent a word called coastscape, I can turn it from a noun into a verb and call it coastscaping um, as a social process. Because, you know, things don't build themselves. People build things. And what are the relationships between people? And how do they do that? And how does it accomplish from a social perspective? That's where the anthropology really melds with the ecology of the situation. So I'm going to talk about that. And it connects us again with resource management, sustainability, resilience, and how that's looked for the last 10,000 years in the Salish Sea. And then I want to come around to talk about, OK, how do we bring all this forward into the, pe the present and the, the future? You know, As you all are aware, we've got a lot of ecological issues we need to deal with over the next while on this planet. And some very acute ones are right here in the Puget Sound and the Salish Sea. What lessons can we take from all this archaeology and thinking about the past into the present and into the future? You know, There's that old adage, right? To know your future, you've got to know your past. 
cost. Very general, feel good kind of statement. But I want to talk about some specific ways in which we might do that through archaeological research and thinking about the intersection of archaeology, anthropology, and the environmental sciences. So I'll give you a couple of brief examples at the end. And that's pretty much the whole, the whole show. So I want to start off here and thinking of a little bit more about the big picture and interdisciplinarity, a couple more comments. You know, I'm on sabbatical from my usual faculty position. And the one thing that allows you to do is get away from the grind, and just sit and look at clouds and think about how the big picture and how your research all fits together. And I kind of made this sort of wheel of ideas one day in a dream or something. I don't know how I put it all together. But all of these things in white are the different dimensions of the research I've been up to for the last 20 years. They connect. Uh, all, all those things connect in certain ways, but they're all different elements of the things I've been doing. And they relate in a bigger picture way to the three green poles you see there. Ecology, archaeologists are very concerned with ecology, past ecologies, reconstructing environments that people operated in the past. There's archaeology, of course, the settlement, the sites, the houses, all of that. And then there's indigenous practices. I work collaboratively with a lot of communities up in British Columbia, uh, the Hulkaminum nations and more widely, and also down here a bit in the south end of Puget Sound with Lummi, uh, or sorry, not, not with Lummi, with um, the Nisqually. Um, have a couple of students working in the San Juans and connecting with the, the Lummi about work out here. So, you know, I work collaboratively. I, th I think of my research as fundamentally a collaborative effort with the people whose his history it is. It wouldn't have any significance if it didn't somehow connect in that, that way. So there's this big wheel of different things I study. They're in, I've kind of organized them into three different poles, I guess. And part of the talk today is about integrating those. You'll notice at the center, there's a gray circle that's about change, right? I think for solutions to our current problems, there's going to have to be a lot of change. And change in certain directions towards more resilient ways of doing food security for all kinds of different peoples, human well-being and health is an important dimension of it, sustainability. So at the center is kind of what we're working towards, is change in those directions. And all these things around it hopefully are all connecting to that. And the ones in blue here are the ones I'm going to touch on today. And the interesting thing about this that, that I kind of like in my own way of keeping my mind sorted out is that the more of those white things you pull into the picture, the more and the more you connect those, the more it cuts through that center, through that change, through those, those big changes that are going to happen to have a more just and sustainable and resilient kind of world. So that's just kind of a way of mapping out the big picture of my brain and why, as an archaeologist, sometimes down with a trowel in a small trench, I keep my mind on this at times to just keep things connected. My research, too, has been really focused on what I call small-scale societies, right? Societies that really existed without large-scale political integration. So, you know, states are large integrated political systems, but I deal a lot with small scale societies. And oftentimes that takes us into questions of the origins of things, thinking about how life has been for, you know, a long time on this planet. We've been around as a genus for two million years. We've been in small scale societies most of that time. We figured out how to do things at the small scale. The archaeological record shows us that, that that's the kind of scale at which we've been doing for a long time. So I just throw this up as some of the, the kinds of topics that come up when you study small scale societies. Of course, most people think of small scale as those that existed without agriculture, right? Hunting and gathering and fishing peoples. So that's been really essentially most of the last two million years of our, our collective history is hunting and gathering and fishing societies operating at a very small scale. How do we find solutions at that scale? Obviously, we live in state societies. So we have to find solutions at that scale. But my point is there's a lot of thinking that's bottom up about how we work from the small up to the big rather than big top-down solutions that are the kinds of things that large-scale nation states tend to do. So I just want to mention that about small-scale societies because, of course, some of the folks out here, indigenous peoples of the Salish Sea and the Northwest Coast in general, are very important examples of doing things at small scale. You know, no cereal agriculture in the way that, that European societies did it. Um, essentially, non-agricultural uh, economies. Um, 
And when you think about hunter-gatherers, a lot of people get this image of these people who live in small groups and move around a lot and have very little or limited impacts on their ecosystems. You know, they live off the land gathering and hunting, but they don't shape those ecologies to any significant degree. But the people out here in this Salish Sea right out our doorstep actually blow the lid off that whole viewpoint. They've been engaging their coastal systems for millennia and shaping those, managing them, constructing them, engineering them in such profound ways. It's important to think about, well, how does that work? And how does it have a long-term historical impact and historical ecology on what, the way we think about the, uh, um, the Salish Sea? There's a lot of an ingenuity to it, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. And I think it shows us a lot of interesting things that we need to take forward. So that's a bit of an introduction for just a couple of minutes. What I want to do is shift into this constructed idea. What is a constructed coastscape? I use that word in the abstract and title for this talk, a coastscape. What is a constructed coastscape? What do I mean by that? Well, this is Vancouver, BC. Anybody who's been up there has probably had a chance to go hang out at the seawall. That's the West End and English Bay there and Stanley Park in the distance on the top one, the small green patch. This is the Stanley Park seawall uh, that you can ride your bike around or wander around. It's a really pleasant little 10 kilometer bike ride around Stanley Park. You know, that's a constructed coastline, right? I mean, people are building seawalls. They're putting in engineered systems to keep the sea out, to create a nice bike path. So most people would say, yeah, I can understand. That's a constructed coastscape, right? And there's the city up there, like I said, English Bay, Sunset Beach. Even though it's a bit more natural than this uh, hard barrier wall, you can still see there's rock jetty-like things. And it's really a managed, engineered system, right, by the city in this, in this case. So most people would say, OK, I get it. Construction of coastlines, the, the engineering and managing of that coastline. But if I took you out to Montague Harbor here on Galliano Island, which is just you know, on the Canadian side, uh, and said, hey, here's Montague Harbor, most people would not immediately say, oh, that's an engineered coastline. It's just a nice beach, and it's just a nice little backwater wetland, and there's lots of forests around. So, most people wouldn't immediately say, oh, yeah, constructed coastline, constructed coastscape. But I, one thing I'm going to try and convince you of uh, is that that coastline is, in so many ways, as engineered as the one in Vancouver, BC today. So that's what I'm going to uh, really get at in terms of how archaeology shows us uh, that the degree to which these places are engineered. And now, here's an interesting a view of what a constructed coastline is from an indigenous perspective. This is from Darcy Matthews and Nancy Turner's uh, really useful chapter on uh, uh, ocean cultures, northwest coast ecosystems, and indigenous management systems. And in fact, next week, I think, Nancy Turner will be here to talk about uh, the traditional ecological knowledge involved with this, and, and I think focusing probably on plants as, as much as anything. But this is an example of all the things that are constructed on these constructed coastscapes, right? Look, Here's a beach, there's an intertidal zone, there's uh, fish traps that are either rock or wood and rock fish traps. There's clam gardens, which of course uh, Marco Hatch has been studying a lot here, in, uh, and uh, all kinds of other elements to it that are actually beyond the intertidal zone on the land. There's managed berry gardens. There's sculpting of landscapes by depositing shell midden. There were old plank houses built in these locations. Um, there's all kinds of different things going on here, you know, including plant gardens for camas or estuarine gardens, those kinds of things. So these are all the things that are built in these locations. And this is a nice summary of what that might look like at any idealized location. And so I've been looking at these things archaeologically. How did they come about, right? This is a nice picture of, of it all in front of you, but how did they actually come about? And how are they expressed where I work? You know, this is a fairly, like I said, idealized version of the, of the whole thing. This is, so let's go up to the Gulf Islands, and I want to show you how these work up in the Gulf Islands and what they look like and the particular expression. And I'm going to show you a bunch of different locations, and I'm going to point out some of the underlying patterns to these 
engineered locations, these constructed coastscapes. And I'm going to show you some of the variation that we see, too, and, and how interesting and complex and significant they are. So this is a small, probably five to six kilometer snapshot at the north end of Galliano Island, the south end of Valdez Island. Again, this is just in the southern Gulf Islands, just north of the San Juans. You can see I've circled four locations right in this almost a five kilometer area that are constructed places. The particular expression that I see in the Gulf Islands is that they're not just along a straight coastline and they're not just in some kind of bay. They're actually on these coastal spit landforms, as I call them. Now, most geomorphologists would call them cuspate spits because, like, say, Shingle Point up there or Cardale Point, there's essentially two beaches that come off the shoreline and meet at a point. So point cuspate, right? Like a tooth, pointed tooth. So Shingle Point's a classic example of two beaches that meet at a point. So is Cardale Point. Dionysio Point's a little different, but it's got two beaches that meet at a, a little rocky uh, upland. You can see Penelicate Spit is a little more complicated, but a variation on a theme. So this is where I've been looking at these particular places, at these what are, would technically be called cuspate spit uh, locations, but I just call them coastal spits because they're quite variable relative to what, the way geomorphologists would define them. So there, there you have Penelicate spit blown up a little bit. You can see there's two beaches that meet at a point out at the end, but there's kind of a third little beach section, and a little rocky upland again, and an intertidal lagoon. So I'm going to show you a few of these things and what they look like. This is Shingle Point first. So this is uh, one I pointed out very first and is the, is the classic two beaches that meet at the point there. Um, it's interesting what's going on here. And it took me a while to sort of figure this out. It took a lot of coring of beaches and doing a lot of work in terms of the deposition that's happening across this, this uh, point and piecing together the, the history of this location as an engineered location. And this gives you a little bit of an uh, oblique, but probably better sense of it. And I'm just going to run through a very generic view of what this is. So 6,600 years ago, it was probably just essentially a straight shoreline. There almost was no shingle point spit at that point. Um, there's feeder bluffs that add sediment down in, and, get, and that gets transported around. And what seemed to have happened sometime after 6,600 years ago is there was a little bit of a, a spit that showed up. That yellow line is two little spits, and there seemed to be a little bit of an embayment there. And then around 4,500 years ago, we see what appears to be a settlement on one of those spits, the more southerly side there, where I've got the 4,500 Cal BP uh, date there. And those are all radiocarbon dates, calibrated radiocarbon dates. Um, so there's an initial settlement of this location, and a lot of shell midden builds up. And then what seems to happen shortly after is there's actually midden placed along, with shell midden meaning the refuse of meals and things like that, the stuff that's you know part of the, the trash, so to speak, although one point I'll make in a few minutes is that this is much more than just trash. What seems to happen is that there's a, a, a barrier of shell midden laid down across there, creating essentially a freshwater bog that's protected from the sea. And a bunch of different plants compared to the estuarine gardens or estuarine system would uh, be tended in that. And so it would have created essentially a freshwater bog where there wouldn't have been one otherwise by adding shell midden essentially as a barrier wall. Now, what seems to happen over successive millennia is that the shoreline prograde. So, you know, these spit locations trap more and more sediment, and there's some other things going on that I won't uh, get into too much detail about. But shorelines prograde, and people add more and more shell midden. They might build a village on these, and it creates a series of stable shorelines. So these are dynamic landforms, particularly this one, which is out in a lot. There's a lot of fetch here. There's a lot of uh, littoral drift, all kinds of stuff. But people are essentially stabilizing these landforms by building villages, by depositing stuff. So it's kind of this coevolution of these landforms by natural and cultural processes. And there's the archaeology is all the way through this, right? So you can see a little bit of what I'm talking about here, a little bit of a relief map there, where you can see some of those stable shorelines that we've mapped in. You know, if we had some nice LIDAR, it'd probably look even more impressive. And there's one of the midden ridges that, essentially, it's an old beach ridge with about two to three meters of shell midden stacked on top of it to create this barrier ridge to the sea. So that's what I mean by constructing coastscapes is, is building this kind of spit through engagements with uh, uh, the landscape and deposition and, and a kind of engineering design. And this is another element to it. Just south of uh, 
shingle point here is a very large clam garden. And now, again, Marco Hatch has been working a lot on clam gardens. And there's this rock wall that, of just piling rocks down at the lowest part of the intertidal zone. This is really at a, almost a zero tide here. It's about the only time you can see these things. A kind of anthropogenic rock wall that extends from the south end of shingle point all the way down into that little nook bay there, a distance of almost a kilometer. So rolling rocks down out of the intertidal zone. And that, you know, if you, for the clam gardens themselves, it creates a habitat in which clams are really, they grow better. You can actually bring clams in and add them in if you want. It's, it's essentially a, a, an aquaculture kind of system. It also has probably a lot of effect on the way the drift happens along here. And it may have actually acted like a jetty or a reef in terms of stabilizing this whole system. So, you know, it's not just the actual point itself. This whole kind of area is engineered in one sense. And this evolves over 5,000 years, right? Some of the earliest radiocarbon dates are around 5,400 years ago. And people were living at this particular location until the 1970s. So 5,000 years of engineering these landscapes. Here's a second one, Montague Harbor. We're moving one island down, but not too far away, maybe eight kilometers away. You can see another example similar in some ways, but a variation on the theme. Now, this isn't the classic cuspate spit in the sense of shingle point, but it has a lot of the same features that connect through the, where you see forests there on the lower peninsula area. Uh, that, those are rock uplands as well. So those are rocky uh, outcrops that create a little bit of a different system. Now, at Montague Harbor, it's quite interesting because we have these shell midden ridges again, but they, they're stacked on top of each other. It's not like there's prograding shoreline. This is a kind of constrained harbor area. But what's going on, actually, is that people are depositing shell midden in ridges for thousands and thousands of years. And it creates, again, a kind of engineered, managed ecosystem, little micro environments that are constructed here. Along where the red lines are is where, I, is where there's shell midden ridges, right? So there's a ridge that connects the bluff behind again to the first rocky uh, outcrop there. There's, and it does it on both sides, creating again another kind of freshwater area that's protected from sea inundation, which would be a, a completely different microenvironment. If we jump one out to where it says intertidal lagoon, it's a similar system. On the back side, there is a full ridge of shell midden again. On the front side, there's only about you know, nine tenths of that closed off. And then there's a, an intertidal lagoon system maintained with a fish trap. So there's a fish trap at the inlet to that. So a different kind of you know, flooded and, and, uh, and uh, dried kind of intertidal lagoon area. Just to give you a shot of what this looks like, it's quite interesting. Um, this is the actual ridge here. We got a chance to cut through the ridge at Montague Harbor. You can see it's pointing up to where it was at the DFRU is the site name, DFRU 13. Doesn't really matter for us. But we've got about 4,000 years of deposition of shell in this thing. People just building up this shell midden as a dike, essentially, a water control feature. And this is all clamshell midden in there. You see down, we've got, even got glacial clay there. That's the original clays that were deposited over all these islands uh, just uh, around the end of the glaciation 14, 13,000 years ago. There's a peat deposit, and then there's just a continuous stacking of shell midden, essentially, for 4,000 years. So it's interesting that all these short-term, small-scale decisions add up to constructing this landscape to create these microenvironments. And there were two villages here as well. So big plank house villages, probably two to 400 people living right in around here. There's actually a third village, just another half a kilometer down the way. There's a, the, one of the stakes of the fish traps that we excavated and radiocarbon dated. And it seems like it was in use until just 100, 150 years ago, actually. So a huge, extensive mid-ridge, four meters deep, another one over there, built up through the actions of people engineering this coastscape. Moving to another one of those sites in that little area. This is Dionysio Point, a site I've worked at since my PhD dissertation. You can see the two beaches meeting at what is essentially the geological landform of Dionysio Point here. There's a large plank house village in behind here, another one just over the way. And a lo again, lots going on here in terms of terraforming, coastscaping. The main thing is that here we can see the village. Uh, we can see a lot of the villages. It's difficult to sometimes see where the ancient plank houses were. But we have one large one here that dates about 1,000 years ago. We have another 
another village that's even earlier where we have five houses in a, in a village. And the thing that this demonstrates, another dimension to it, is how much people terraform the landscape to create these village locations. This isn't a shell-midden construction. It's actually a kind of rocky slope, and there's a lot of cut and fill to create flat terraces for large plank houses. So you know, people were engaging not just with shell, but with earth, and essentially creating terraced village locations at a fairly large scale. So it's quite interesting, just another dimension to which people were engaging these, these uh, environments and constructing them for what, what they were interested in. This is just a, a sort of gravy shot. This is what it looks like to excavate inside one of these large plank houses. You know, a 10 by 20 meter house that housed five or six families. Um, the interesting thing about this is these were the kinds of units, social units, that were really actively working as collective units to, to do a lot of this. And as I'll mention in just a minute, probably the level at which a lot of these uh, features were owned. It was sort of household-based ownership of different uh, elements. Um, another element to this equation that's interesting, Cardale Point, again, in that same five kilometer radius. Another coastal spit, you'll recognize it, dates to about 4,800 years ago at the base of the shell midden layers. A large village on the flat, but up behind is actually what's called a trench embankment. This is a large, essentially a fort. It's a large knoll that's been cut and piled so that it's a, and a palisade likely was around as a defensive feature. It's like a large defensive hill fort like you might find in Iron Age Europe. So an incredible amount of labor moving earth to create, again, a, a terraformed landscape. So people drive by in boats, and they just see it as some kind of nice place to park and have a swim, and don't recognize that this is, you know, an, again, a, a complexly engineered landscape for 5,000 years. Um, just to mention a few other dimensions of, the, of the, what's going on here, if we go up the Fraser River from Vancouver, BC, or even out onto Vancouver Island, we see large mortuary features around 1,500 years ago to 2,000 years ago, people were also terraforming the landscape by creating big, huge fields of essentially burial monuments. Something, again, not typically associated with non-agricultural societies. So this extended from very basic resource production concerns through to you know, defensive structures in, in the context of political warfare and how people venerated the dead and, and venerated ancestors. It's, you know, the scale uh, which is happening from the point of physically moving stuff is impressive, but the different dimensions to it is pretty complicated and pretty interesting. And that's really been, you know, my archaeology is to document these over the last 15 to 20 years. I mean, part of the reason that indigenous peoples were alienated from their lands is because European colonial folks thought there was, well, they don't grow cereal crops like Europeans do, so they must not have meaningful connections to the land, and it can be just taken. But documenting this kind of stuff there is really critical and showing the in inherent connection with the ecology and the inherent connection to place, the construction of place physically, and the construction of connections to place conceptually, and the long history over which that happened is incredibly important in a place like Canada where most indigenous nations are on the West Coast are involved in treaty renegotiations to establish what Aboriginal title means, to establish what resources they have access to, to establish what their traditional territories were. I mean, to, 20 years ago, people thought the Gulf Islands were just this kind of seasonal camp way station on the way from Vancouver Island to the mainland. Uh, the archaeological record has shown that that's a really untenable way of thinking about it. So, shell middens, they're more than just trash heaps. Actually, the record of this coastal engineering over 5,000 years in the service of resource production and many other things. And that's me excavating at the Perry Lagoon Midden, which this looks like just a shell midden, and most people would say that's what it is when they walk by, but it's actually also a burial site. It's also the back ridge of a house. It's also a, a very important place on the landscape. It's a prominent feature that you'd see if you came across in a canoe from the mainland. It's one of the first things you'd see marking place, and it was used for 2,000 years, built up and people, ancestors interred, and it's really quite an important place. So it just goes, underscores the whole complexity of, of the system. 
So that's a run through the archaeology. So hopefully that's sort of convinced you of how profound the engagements with, with landscapes were out there, coastscaping was. So back to, to uh, Nancy Turner and Darcy Matthews' diagram here. Um, interesting, nice summary of, of the different kinds of things that were going on, but it is a bit static, right? It creates an impression that, oh, these places are like this. Well, they came to be like this through a long process. And that's where the archaeology is really interesting. It sort of shows how could such a, a system actually develop? How did it develop? How did it happen? How did it come about? I mean, through radiocarbon dating and archaeological work, we know that it wasn't always there. It emerged over thousands of years. And what was that process? And getting back to the theme of change, we saw an incredible amount of change in the Salish Sea over the last 5,000 years. How did people get to a, under high population densities with lots of villages to a place where they could sustainably manage the ecologies out there in the Salish Sea? That's an interesting thing, because that's really what we need to figure out how we're going to do now, right? So that's important, to understand that there's a long burn, that it was constructed and created. And that's what I want to get into talking just to for briefly about the social element of it. You know, these places didn't build themselves. How did people manage to organize themselves to build this? That's been another really interesting question for me to consider. Um, you know, Nancy and, and Darcy in their paper do a really good job of discussing the variety of different things. You know, they include landscape burning, and I haven't even really talked about all of the management of berry patches and, and camas gardens and all kinds of wapato fields that was happening on the land. I've been focusing mostly on the coastscapes here. So, but they do a good job of documenting that in the paper. I'd recommend you go finding it, especially ahead of Nancy coming next week and, and read that paper. It would be really useful just to, to, to help bring this all together. But, you know, talking about the idea of uh, they also touch on and, and do a pretty good job of thinking about, well, what is the social unit that's doing this? What are, how are people actually doing this? What's the social element to it? And I think this is really interesting because they bring up such ideas of, of ownership and proprietorship. Well, ownership, you know, the idea that uh, we see it in the ethnographic record that places were actually owned by individual people or families, right? Some of these clam gardens or these fish weirs, there was a lot of ownership notions around this. It wasn't public property. There was a lot of uh, control over access to these places. And it's interesting to think about how that all came to be, too, and what it, what it means. Um, you know, because technologies are interesting. They always need a social context in which they can be made possible and the social practices and institutions that make them successful. You know, and this is one thing as an anthropologist when I think about solutions to problems today. You know, we have this idea that we can sort of technologize and invent our way to a solution. But there always needs to be the social context in which that can be applied out in the world. And that's, it's interesting to think about how Coast Salish people did this, you know. And I'm going to touch on just a couple of elements of the social aspects of it because I think they're important. This whole idea of ownership and proprietorship. Well, proprietorship is, is, is kind of a version of the word ownership used by Ronald Trosper and, a, and now a lot of archaeologists and anthropologists talking about the idea that these places were owned not because it was private property, but because fish traps and clam gardens needed to be managed and maintained by individuals to keep them productive. They could be easily overexploited. If everybody had access to it, they could be overexploited. They were very precise systems of, of relating to the ecology that required people to observe the cycle of production to manage that, to control when things were harvested. And so people did that. And they had a, a right to manage the harvest itself and that kind of thing, how resources were allocated, who could harvest when. But it wasn't just, you know, it's private property. There was a, a duty to manage it for the greater good. Right? And that's where the term proprietorship probably makes more sense than ownership. Ownership is kind of laden with a bunch of, you know, get off my claim kind of private property notions, where ownership or proprietorship, let's call it, was about managing it for the greater good, right? There was a duty, even though you owned it and controlled access to it, it was your responsibility to maintain it in a way that kept production going. So that's important. It's a different institution of ownership socially than what we're used to and accustomed to in sort of modern Western capitalist societies. So that's, that's important. Um, 
so people were in charge of maintaining these places, and they were, it was often a family, it was often a household, a large household, a community, potentially. So it was quite critical to just maintain all of that. Um, so local people were in charge of doing that maintenance, right? These were local people who had connections to that landscape. It wasn't like decisions about when to harvest would be made far off, right? It was a very autonomous kind of system which are local villages or houses were monitoring these resources and controlling access. And I think that's an important point to, uh, to take away. All of those people were coordinated regionally in a lot of senses. I mean, the potlatch is something that people are quite familiar with as a, uh, a feasting ceremony in Northwest Coast cultures. But one of the functions of the potlatch in Salish cultures was also to share information, to kind of bring together a bunch of people and share our notions, share resources. And so there was a bunch of autonomous actors managing these resource production features, but they were all knit together through certain specific institutions that shared knowledge and, and meant that you know, nobody was acting independently. It was a coordinated kind of system. So I think that's interesting to think about as an alternative to the way we maybe manage resources with top-down agency kind of directives and things like that. A bunch of local actors monitoring closely the resource, but connected through institutions that mobilize that local knowledge and use it to understand how this whole system is going to coordinate. So that's the social side of it, right? This idea that there is a social dimension to how this gets, gets handled. And I think that's important from the point of view of, of just thinking through how this all worked and a lesson for us to think about the social reality of what's going on in the past with this. this uh, um, like I said, as a social process is the way I like to actually think about it. This is just something I kind of like. You know, I talk about this a lot, right? That making place is a physical construction, but it also is a, the construction of society, too. The things we make make us, right? The way we physically transform the landscape is also in its own way a social transformation or involves a social transformation. And I talk about this a lot and go give lectures on the time. And then I saw this Jeep ad and I thought, you know, in six words, the, the advertising hacks at Jeep kind of summed up exactly what I'm getting at here. And I put the re in there just because I think it keeps going on and on and on and on. So yeah, the question that I'll kind of lay out there, and I'm just going to run briefly through three real important examples, I think, of, but very brief examples of how we can uh, um, bring all this idea forward. So coastal spits as a social process. How did all of these practices result in sustainability and resilience in the Salish Sea? I'll leave that with you. Okay, so as I mentioned at the outset, you know, I can go do all this interesting archaeology, but if it doesn't have some import to how we're going to figure out future solutions to our ecological problems, how we can make the research I'm doing archaeologically meaningful in terms of the First Nations history that it really is, it's just research. So I've been trying to think a lot about how archaeology can contribute in a meaningful way to future solutions. You know, most people don't think of solutions coming from studying small-scale societies. You know, our, the scale of our societies are so large that uh, how could it possibly have relevance? And yes, we don't we're just gonna look in the past and have templates for how we might solve problems. But in analyzing the processes and the ways things worked in the past, we can get ideas about the diversity of what's possible in human societies. And I think that's important. So the first one I'm going to talk about is shorelines. I'm going to talk a little bit about diversity. And then I'm just going to talk about governance. Shorefriendly.org. Anybody heard of it? It's a Washington State funded organization that tries to get landowners or people with coastal property to not build seawalls, to not do the, the seawall thing, but to have shorelines that are soft, that are ecologically productive, that are not just hard barriers to the sea. So how do we do that? Well, you know, the interesting thing when I think about this is that indigenous peoples have been doing soft shorelines for 10,000 years. What is it about how they did shorelines that we might be able to bring forward and say, well, let's, let's take some of those elements and bring them forward and think about how we might create ecologically and uh, sustainable shorelines in the future. 
And you might be able to understand that a little bit too now that I've gone through it. And there's up at UBC, I, I threw this out because you know, there's a living breakwaters project going on there to figure out how to save shorelines along UBC where they're rapidly eroding. I mean, shorelines are eroding, they're being affected by climate change, um, they're being affected by development, and that's really having a detrimental effect on the Puget Sound. And we need to solve this part of the equation if we're going to get to an ecologically resilient Puget Sound. Because, you know, of course, sea levels are going up. Um, how do we build shoreline systems that actually are resilient in the face of climate change and, and whatnot? And, you know, the answer is, what I've seen at Coastal Spits is that you need adaptive iterative solutions. There's no one solution for all time. And people were adding to shorelines, augmenting them, embellishing them, maintaining them over thousands of years. Part of the reason why we're seeing so much erosion, especially around archaeological sites in the Salish Sea, where there's a big problem with archaeological sites being eroded by the sea, is that First Nations people aren't there continually adding to these anymore. No one's iteratively managing and building and adaptively reconstructing perpetually all these uh, shorelines. So this is something that's, you know, that's a, a, a midden site right there around the back of a village. I, I showed the excavation of it earlier and described that. We tried to rebuild it. It didn't work. It got trashed. We rebuilt it again in 2018. We're sort of figuring out how we can do a soft shoreline in these places that maintains an ecological uh, dynamic, but also helps preserve the archaeological record that's behind it. It'll probably last 10 years, 15 years, but geez, in 10 or 15 years, who knows what sea levels will be doing. We, maybe that's about the scale at which we need to think about solutions anyway. So this is one thing where how can we take practices in the past and sort of think about how that shapes the way we view shorelines in the future and how we're going to make more resilient, sustainable shorelines. So that's one example. The second example is about diversity. And I happen to be on a project out of Japan, out of the Institute for uh, uh, the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature in Kyoto, and it was led by Junko Habu of, of Berkeley, uh, Cal Berkeley. And the whole idea was really to say, well, what can we take away from how small-scale societies do things that helps us create more sustainable, resilient kinds of systems. And there was a lot of dimensions to this, but one of the important dimensions that really came out was that, and that I think connects the strategies we see in the past of the Salish Sea to the way we need to think about the future is this whole idea of diversity, right? I mean, these are, so this is such an intensely locally diverse kind of production system here. Diversity matters, right? People, the whole idea, uh, the way people study small-scale societies often, especially you know, hunter-gatherer, fisher societies, is that if there's a lot of resources, they'll focus on the one that they can get the most out of to the exclusion of others. But here, diversity was clearly the plan at a local, very local level. Constructing and maintaining microenvironments and resource production was really a local diversity issue. And people work to maintain that in an active way over thousands of years. So this idea that diversity really matters, and it's diversity at a local scale that really matters. So that's important. You know, when we think, well, how do we scale diversity as a concept in thinking about resilience and restoring something like a Puget Sound or a Salish Sea? Well, local diversity is important. Third thing I'll mention is just governance. How do we make this happen? I'm part of a, a science panel as is Ruth sitting in the back there, that is uh, funded by the Puget Sound Partnership. And there's, and its objective is to think about how we're going to restore Puget Sound, how we're going to make an ecologically resilient Puget Sound sometime in the future. And there's all kinds of ways in which we measure the health of the sound. And there's, you know, it's funded by the governor's office or generally the state. And there's a science panel, a social science panel, a leadership panel. There's a bunch of local action groups and things like this. And you know, in some ways, to me, it kind of mirrors the system that Salish people used. It's kind of strange to say that because we're in a nation state system, but there's a lot of local actors that are monitoring the on the ground conditions. There's a whole um, env environmental or ecological monitoring board that watches local conditions, the knowledge is mobilized, 
there's a kind of institution that makes sure that knowledge gets circulated and objectives are shared. And there's a kind of interesting sort of parallel in the way this system works to the way Coast Salish people mobilized and shared knowledge in the past. And this is interesting because if the Coast Salish version was successful, maybe something like this actually is the kind of, it stresses the local autonomy and local knowledge, but has an institution connect, that connects all of those people so that knowledge can get mobilized. Because if there's one thing about federal agencies, they don't tend to mobilize local knowledge as well as they could. They tend to be very centralized kinds of agencies in their decision making. So governance, what kinds of social institutions do we need to mobilize the solutions? I think that's really quite critical. So it's all there. Past, present, future. We've got to think broadly. I mean, we've got some serious challenges. We can draw from just about anywhere to try and find innovative solutions, including small-scale societies. So that's it. Hopefully that conveys some of what, what I've been up to. Thanks. For a couple questions? I'm always game for questions. Do you ever run into any sort of like resistance or pushback when you want to go and uh, excavate some of these sites? Well, the, there's always concerns about excavation, but the solution is it's done collaboratively with the nations whose history it is. So I work closely with the Penelicate, I work closely with Lyax, and, and that's the only way really in my view to do the archaeology now. So it's, it's, and it's not even just about going asking permission, it's about what are the questions that are important to the communities whose history this is, and can I help? You know, so if that's the strategy you take, you, you either get two kinds of responses. One, no thanks, we're, we're good, or yeah, here's some of the things that we'd really like to know. So, you know, the archaeology of it connects with a lot of issues, especially around things like clam gardens, um, restoring the traditional knowledge, or bringing, re-amalgamating, I guess, the traditional knowledge, and melding archaeology with traditional ecological knowledge held in the community. So, so there's an opportunity to just circumvent those issues uh, by just starting ground up to being collaborative. And that's, in my view, that's the only way you really should and can do archaeology pragmatically. No community is monolithic, right? There are, there's a lot of traditional views in communities about that those are just ancestral places. They just shouldn't be disturbed. But that's not my place to weigh in as an archaeologist. The communities need to sort that out for themselves. So. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So based on your vast experience, both in the um, ancient sites you're studying and with the Puget Sound Partnership, I'm wondering if you can share any wisdom why the difference in the results, where the communities you've been studying have been there for many millennia and manage those sustainably, whereas with the Puget Sound Partnership vital signs, so many of those are either getting worse or barely not improving very much. Hmm. Is there something that you can draw between the different cultures that is responsible for that difference, or is, is it something else? Well, there's probably some easy answers just to say, you know, sort of industrial capitalism doesn't have a lot of <laughs> long-term view of sustainability. And I think that's probably a better answer would be the long-term. I mean, those places are, people have been there for 5,000 years, you know, they understand that that, that's a profound connection. And I think that's probably part of the problem uh, that we're dealing with now is how do we make, sh how do we get people to invest in long-term decisions at the, rather than just short-term decisions of maximizing some kind of thing. So I think, you know, as an anthropologist, I think on that a lot. And, and if we could really get people to think about long-term rather than short-term, I think that would be a really interesting and profound bed for change. Uh, that, so, 
the more specifics about the Puget Sound Partnership, it's not perfect, it's in a nation state, it's, you know, it, it, there's seriously qualitative differences that have to be taken into account. But I think there is a lot of consciousness about that is, you know, how do you connect people to place and make them value those places and therefore make longer term decisions to understand what it's been, where it is now and where it needs to be and really be prepared to invest in that. That's really, uh, that's really what, what I would say as, as the, the most basic answer. I think we're out of time, but um, you know, encourage people to come down if you have another question that didn't go. You know, yeah. Got a few more minutes still. Yeah, I'm hanging around for a bit. Great. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone.